In a one-on-one -on -one interview tonight, Governor Phil Murphy lamenting losing Democrat Tom Malinowski's representation in Washington, D.C., but stopped short of agreeing that the incumbent congressman was hung out to dry by the party. Instead, predicting the Malinowski name will be around for some time to come. Governor Murphy, first of all, thanks for taking some time uh, to talk with us on this day after the election. Um, let's talk about District 7. Last night, we heard from Tom Malinowski uh, that he was frustrated. He was written off, essentially, by Democrats a year ago in the redistricting process. What's your response to that? Um, was the party wrong to sacrifice him? Listen, I, I, I think a lot of factors uh, are at play. Um, Tom is outstanding. I first heard his name when he was on the Human Rights Watch at the State Department from John McCain, of all people. Um, he is, he's been a great congressman. Uh, this is a tough year to run. We had a lot, of, a lot of close races, not just in New Jersey, but nationally as well. And I will just say we have not heard the last of Tom Malinowski, I, I guarantee you that. He is an outstanding public servant. And he's got great days still ahead of him, and I hope in service in New Jersey in some way, shape, or form. Overall, a pretty good evening for Democrats, certainly fending off what analysts had predicted as that so-called red wave. What was your takeaway, Governor, especially, you know, you were out stumping uh, as the head of the Democratic Governors Association. Um, your takeaway on how Democrats fared. You make a good point. Other than Tom Malinowski's close loss, uh, you know, nine of the 10 Democratic incumbent members of the House in New Jersey uh, won, some of them in tight races, and then around the country, uh, you did not see the red wave that folks were talking about. Uh, and I think there are a number of reasons, Brianna, if I had to point to a few, uh, Democrats, particularly at the end, got a lot better at telling our story, particularly on the economy and affordability and opportunity. I think secondly, both reproductive freedom and abortion on the one hand and threat to democracy on the other hand, finally rose up the list of concerns. The Republicans were playing this crime card shamelessly, and I have to say effectively, uh, and it drowned out real concerns about election deniers or women's right to an abortion or other reproductive freedoms. And I think again, at the end, those issues finally bubbled up as, as main factors. And I'd say lastly, uh, we had better candidates, <laughs> to call it plain and simple. Uh, and uh, they showed their, their worth and, and, uh, and their, and their um, strengths, uh, particularly as we closed the elections out. Did the candidates, Governor, uh, maybe uh, they always matter, but matter even more than the messaging? There was so much talk about messaging, about Democrats coalescing around a, a single idea, similarly to how the GOP was and, and the momentum that the party gained leading up to this. Yeah. Did it really just come down to who had the better candidates? I think it's a combination. Um, you know, we're famous for not being crisp on our message, which drives me crazy as a party. But I think it's a combination of a whole number of things, uh, including an acknowledgement, particularly in the House races, frankly, the Senate as well, that uh, the Congress had done historic things this year, uh, and the president uh, signed those bills, and the president is standing on the right side of history, transformational action. And I think it's a combination of that, along with outstanding candidates, that got us the results that we got. Listen, we're not declaring victory yet. We're still light in the House uh, at the moment, and I'd say the Senate I'd rather be us than them, uh, but it is still very close. And we've got a couple of governor's races that are in the balance. So uh, I, I don't want to I want to be careful not to talk about all this in the past tense. We're still in the fight. Yeah, there's still a lot hanging in the balance there. Let me ask you about the get out the vote effort by Democrats. Turnout was still about 10 points lower across the board than in the 2018 midterms. Did Democrats do enough to get the amount of enthusiasm that perhaps some folks in the party um, expected to be there? Yeah, I have to believe when the numbers are, when you compare it to the like cycle in 2018, as you pointed out, and we're under underperforming that number, you, you have to look in the mirror and say, uh, not just in New Jersey, but as a party across the country, uh, we, we got to do more, we got to do better. 
we got to make sure in particular that we're lighting up uh, the imaginations and the aspirations of our young people. So I think that's going to be one of the lessons that we as a party have to take from this. We have to do better at getting folks uh, to get out there and cast their ballot. They, having them angry uh, and, and or excited or both, depending on the issue, is necessary but it's not sufficient. We got to get more people to the polls. It came up uh, actually a couple of times uh, throughout our coverage last evening, Governor, about last year's statewide race, your gubernatorial race being somewhat of a precursor for the party. Obviously, very tight margins. Uh, your colleague just across the river, Kathy Hochul, winning her race, but again, uh, a tighter race than folks might expect for a, a you know an area with uh, so many Democratic voters. What message did that send, and what changes has the the party made coming off of last year? Yeah, well, first of all, the early in-person voting, which was the first time out last year, second time this year, up meaningfully. I think you're going to continue to see that element of turnout uh, become increasingly more important. Yeah, I think you're right. I think our race last year, by the way, Brianna, at this moment, a year ago, my race was still not called. I think I got called it at, uh, just around the time that this interview was airing. So, um, I think we were the canary in the coal mine, and I think it was, uh, I, I'm not sure a wake-up call, but it certainly was a reminder that we need to be meaningfully and tangibly at everybody's kitchen table, whether it's affordability, whether it's opportunity, whether it's reigniting the American dream, what, you know, that your kids are going to do better than, than mom and dad. Uh, that you're going to have access to a high quality education, high quality health care, a job that pays real wages and benefits, that we as a party need to be front and center uh, in those discussions, those very personal discussions. I think we ultimately got there because we've got a good story to tell. It took us a while, but I think we got there. So it sounds like you're feeling pretty good about where things stand. You know, there was an FDU poll released today. You may have seen it uh, where residents are relatively happy with the job you're doing, but they don't have an appetite uh, for you seeking higher office, specifically the presidency. So we have to ask if you plan to run for president. No, I mean, I, I expect and I now more expect today than I did even yesterday that President Biden uh, will run again, particularly if uh, former President Trump gets in the race. And I've been unequivocal. Uh, I'm assuming that's going to happen. And if it does happen, he'll have no bigger supporter. I've not seen the poll, by the way, but I'm glad to hear folks things, uh, think things are, are going well. I don't want anyone to think, though, that we're, that we're patting ourselves on the back or that we think we've got all of our problems solved, because we don't. We still have we inherited a broken state. It's a lot better than it was, but we still have a long way to go. Governor Phil Murphy, thanks for your time, sir. Thanks for having me, Brianna.